Welcome to the um, latest session, um, session on invisibility. I just uh, just like to say that what the best quote on invisibility you go to the Bain image and her uh, talking about being inside the invisible, but I wouldn't say that. Okay, but um, today we've got um, uh, two papers in the session. And the first is um, going to be given by uh, Cedric Courtois. Uh, and Cedric is a uh, senior lecturer at the University of Leo in France and uh, specialises in Nigerian literature. And we've already been having some interesting conversations. Uh, he's um, uh, got many recent publications and he also branches out into Black British and post colonial literature. Today he's speaking on African precarious and invisible lives in Europe. Carol Phillips' Northern Lights and Jennifer Nesberger, Macumbi's Memoirs of Anamosa and our allies, the Colonies. I'll hand over to Cedric. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alan. And thanks to um, the organizers. I'm very glad uh, to be here with you today. Um, I'll be speaking about uh, literature, something very different from what we heard before. And I think and I hope you'll find echoes with, with uh, what has um, already been said. Right, so um, in uh, Christmas is Coming, the first uh, short story in Jennifer Nansubuga Mukumbi's short story collection entitled Manchester happened, published in 2019. A 13-year-old teenager of Ugandan origins describes the impressions felt by many Africans once they arrive uh, in Britain. So that's the first quote. It's Christmas Eve and the sun the sly one that appears in winter to taunt Africans has come out. You've just arrived from home and discovered that Britain is inside a fridge. Uh, the novelty of snow wears off and you beg the sun to come out. Who told you to leave Africa, it sneers. And then one morning it appears, you bolt outside to get some sunshine and whack, the winter cold wallops you. So the violence of the cold weather on the bodies of Africans conveyed through the alliteration W and the onomatopoeia functions as an allegory of the social violence undergone once they arrive and or settle in Europe. So right from the very beginning of this collection, uh, which deals with the fictional experiences of Ugandan migrants in Manchester, Makumbi, herself a Ugandan, has been living in Manchester for some years focuses on a teenager who yearns to go back to Uganda, and in order to do so, plans to falsely accuse his parents of neglect in front of British authorities in order for the whole family to be deported back to Uganda. So although this passage is humorous, it also puts to the fore the impact of a change in the place of living for African subjects. The whole collection tackles the issue of life in Britain for these Ugandan migrants in Britain, uh, uh, from the 1950s to the present. As a matter of fact, Mukumbi aims at unveiling the harsh reality behind the European dream that many Africans might nourish, something that uh, Franco-Senegalese writer Fatou Diom also talks about, for example. So to play with one of the titles of, uh, from the short story collection, Mukumbi aims at uh, uh, telling uh, this uh, short story, this story, of migration uh, properly. Uh, um, so that is to say, she aims to explain to her Ugandan or African, more generally readers, that life in Europe is not as easy as they could think it is, and to her Euro European readers that Europe is not the El Dorado they think it is for Africans. So within the confines of this paper, we'll mainly focus on two short stories, uh, Memoirs of an Amaso, Basically, its main character is a Ugandan uh, stray uh, dog that arrives in Manchester and that is forced to alter and lose its identity as a Ugandan stray to become a British pet. It uh, therefore sees its cultural legacy die when landing in Europe. The second short story is entitled Our Allies to Colonies, and its main character is a Ugandan man who arrives in Britain as a stowaway and renames himself Abby Baker in order to try and blend in 1950s Britain. 
Now, one can argue that these two characters live invisible and to some extent precarious lives that can be deemed unlivable, to quote Butler and Bones. In a similar manner, uh, um, we have a, a Kittitian British novelist, Carol Phillips, um, who uh, foregrounds uh, the lives of three black men in Foreigners, Three English Lives, uh, published in, 20, in 2007. And this title clearly puts to the fore a paradox. This book is composed of three independent biographical texts, each one of them focusing on the life of one black man in Britain. The first two are uh, Francis Barber, 18th century uh, Samuel Johnson's servant and British boxer Randolph Turpin, who was famous in the 1940s and 50s. And a question related to thematic similarities with Macumbi's short stories, Our Allies, the Colonies and Memoirs of Namaso, I have decided to focus on the third part of the book entitled uh, Northern Lights, uh, which to quote the back cover of the book is about uh, David Oluwale, a Nigerian stowaway who arrived in Leeds in 1949, whose life and death would question the reality of English justice and serve as a wake up call for the entire nation. David Oluwale was found uh, drowned in the River Eyre in 1969 after years of having been persecuted by the British uh, police in Leeds. And from the, this perspective, the fact that one of the possible etymological roots of air, the Eyre River, is the Celtic Welsh word air, A-E-R, meaning slaughter, is interesting here. So I'd like to offer a comparative study of Macumbi's two short stories and Phillips's text for some of the reasons I have identified, among which the fact that they tackle the same subject, i.e. African migration to Europe. Among other things, I wish to talk about the circulation of African migrant bodies in the migratory space of England. Moreover, I want to play with one of Macumbi's short story uh, titles uh, and the title chosen for the whole collection in the US, let's tell this uh, story properly. And I would add, let's tell this short uh, story uh, properly to try and offer a reflection on the use of the short story genre by Macumbi and a short format by Phillips, a short format difficult to define, but that is linked to the genre of life writing. So what could be the motivation behind these generic choices? What do these choices bring when it comes to conveying these African migrants' experiences in Europe? I will also ponder over the issues of identity, mobility, and the strategies of visibility, invisibility. Right, so that was a long introduction. So uh, uh, first part, postcode take on these transcultural texts. I'd like to argue that Macumbi's Two Short Stories and Phillips's Life Writing Peace are trans transcultural texts that are interested in the dialogic dynamic between cultures. They describe people who are deterritorialized, who are on the move across cultural and national boundaries. They describe African lives elsewhere to play with the title of Nigerian writer Segun Aflabi's short story collection, A Life Elsewhere, that deals with African migration and the feeling of uprootedness. One of the most interesting short stories in Manchester happened when it comes to moving across national and cultural boundaries is entitled Memoirs of an Amaso, whose main character is called Stowe, uh, an echo to some extent to our allies, the colonies, where the main character legally arrived in, in Britain on board a ship. And Macumbi ventriloquizes the experiences of a Ugandan stray dog that has, much to his disgust, become a British pet. This uh, story is, only one in the, is the only one in the collection using the first person pronoun. Uh, Phillips uh, does use the first, uh, first person pronoun, but also the third person pronoun in, in Northern Lights. We'll come back to that. It's as though Macumbi had made sure not to use a first person narrative elsewhere to avoid appropriating a human being's life, uh, therefore speaking for him or her, a reflection launched, among others, uh, by uh, Gayatri uh, Spivak in Can the Sabatin Speak, by Linda Martin Alkaf in The Problem of Speaking for Others, or more recently by Amy Schumann, Carol Burma, and Eric Niyitunga in Telling Our Own Stories on, uh, and Speaking on Behalf of Others. So Memoirs of an Amaso, as I said before, is about a dog's change of status, its deterritorialization and re-territorialization, both physical and cultural, as it's taken from Ugandan in a trunk to Britain on a plane by mistake. 
The short uh, story starts uh, like this. My British name is Stowe. I'm 16 human years old and I was born a pariah dog in Uganda. Call me feral if you are contemptuous. I only became a pet when I arrived in Britain 15 years ago. I have three or four weeks to live. Although this short story is at times funny, I want to argue that through this allegory, Macumbi exposes the dehumanization lived by African immigrants, lived by African migrants, the drastic cultural changes they face when they arrive in a country and in a culture that they had never known before. So the title of this short story also raises the question of the writing of memoirs as if it were a matter of life or death for this dog to tell its own side of the story and by extension, as if it were essential for African migrants to tell their side of the story to tell their own story properly and to avoid the single story, uh, to quote Chimamanda and Gozi Adichie's 2009 TED talk. And of course, they don't want to let Western media tell their story for them. So the short choice of the short story genre is, is worth uh, taking a look at, as basically Western media, especially so during the 2015 refugee crisis, have tended to depict large crowds of migrants advancing towards Europe without giving these people a voice, an individual voice to be more precise. The choice of the short story genre by Macumbi is not innocent. She can be said, and the same can be argued about Phillips, to be a co-witness, to quote Irene uh, Kakandis, uh, a co-witness of the plight lived by some uh, African migrants. For Kakandis, the co-witness, I hope I have this quote, I don't have the quote, sorry about this, I'm gonna to have to uh, uh, say it to you. So the co-witness, I quote, has a desire to think about others, to listen respectfully to their stories or to help research them, to learn their details and complexities. So choosing the short story genre can be perceived as political, as to quote Irish uh, writer Frank O'Connor, um, the short story remains by its very nature remote from the community, romantic, individualistic, and intransigent. O'Connor further adds that the short story genre helps foreground an intense awareness of human loneliness, something that is also present in Phillips's Northern Lights. The loneliness alluded to by O'Connor is that of submerged population groups, those on the margins of society, the little men, Gogol's officials, Turgenev's serfs, Maupassant's prostitutes. And it seems important for Makumbi and Phillips to give Ugandan and Nigerian individuals marginals in these collections, if not a voice, at least some visibility. And in uh, Northern Lights, Phillips renders visible David Oluwale, a Nigerian man who was marginalized, ostracized and persecuted by the British police, as I said before, in the 1940s, 50s, leads. The short story therefore seems to be used to foreground the experiences of marginal people. And in the context of the modernist short story, Viorica Patea explains that it's uh, uh, defined by its brief, fragmentary, inclusive form. Ian Reid also argues that it's defined uh, that in the context of 19th century French literature that, I quote, Mostly it could be left to the novel to delineate those large scale social patterns, which were so amply extended within urban life. The short story seemed especially suitable for the portrayal of regional life or of individuals who, though situated in a city, lived there as aliens. And this is also backed once again by Viorica Patea as she sees the short story as a form at the margins. So Stow the Dog, and I think we can clearly draw a parallel with David Oluwole in Northern Lights, who's described as a Nigerian stowaway. Uh, uh, so Stow the Dog explains, that's the next quote, I am the first Namaso to see the British eyes and the story of how I, I ended up here, what I've seen, would blow the fur off your coat. Lately, because the days to my passing, to my passing on are long, the nights are slow, memories have been coming. I thought I may as well write them down. Besides, that name Stowe is full of lies. I should tell my side of the story. So beyond Stowe's reflection upon his British name, that is full of lies. Uh, 
uh, it is, it, as it's been renamed by, renamed by its British owner, once the latter discovered that they had brought a dog from Kampala by mistake, there seems to be a more profound reflection on naming and renaming and the process of telling your own story in this collection. So if we take the example of uh, our allies, the colonies, uh, which is set in the 1950s, the main character, Abby, arrives by boat, just like David in Northern Lights, um, in Manchester on the Manchester Ship Canal. The reader learns that Abby has had a mobile life. I quote, at the time, Abby's name was Abu Bakri. He had named himself when he first arrived in Mombasa, even though he was not circumcised. Mombasa, especially the port, was run by Arabs and Zanzibaris who had a deep mistrust for non-Muslims and contempt for Africans. Luckily, his skin tone was light enough to pass himself off as Muslim. Soon he was cursing and swearing like an Arab. When he arrived in Britain, he changed Abu to Abbey, like Westminster Abbey, and Bakri to Baker, like Sir Samuel Baker. But his grandfather has named him, had named him Suna Junju. And this passage, I believe, attests to the great capacity of adaptation for this transcultural character who's able to play with the fluidity of his identity in what can be called uh, a liquid age, to quote uh, Zygmunt Bauman. Abbey is indeed described as a chameleon. His renaming does have uh, consequences as far as identity is concerned. The fact that he chooses a name that cannot be more English, huh, Abbey Baker, shows his willingness to try and erase his cultural legacy. One of his friends, Kwe, a Ghanaian, who unlike Abi, decides to keep his name, makes him notice that the choice of Abi as a first name, referring to Westminster Abbey, a seat of power, and Baker as a surname after Samuel Baker, the 19th century white British explorer, are extremely ironical. And according to Kwe, this constitutes a problem. The fact that uh, characters like Abi decide or are not given the choice to rename themselves, clearly indicates that people like him from colonies are far from being considered as allies. Um, my second point is about the question of identity. And I'd like to quote here, uh, uh, Edward Said in Reflections on Exile, where he explains, uh, exile is strangely compelling to think about, but terrible to experience. It's the unhealable rift force between a human being and a native place, between the self and its true home. Its essential sadness can never be uh, surmounted. Yes, thank you. He um, also talks about uh, estrangement uh, of something left behind forever. And he argues that the status of exile is legislated to deny dignity, to deny an identity to people. Because exile is fundamentally a discontinuous state of being, exiles are cut off from their roots, their land, their past. The characters in these short stories all experience exile and stasis. This is called uh, being stuck in transitness, um, something I found in another short story uh, entitled en Extending a Hand, a short story by Olumide Pupula and Annie Holmes in their uh, short story collection entitled Breach, dealing with migrants and refugees stuck in the Calais camp. As people who are undesired uh, in Europe, to quote Michel Agier, African migrants undergo a logic of suspension, of survivalism, and of long-lasting precarity, to quote Camille Schmoll. They live a life on the border. They experience the border. They're neither here nor there. They're in between beings who simul simultaneously inhabit two locations, making them uh, unable to establish any fixed identity in the third space. And I'm thinking here, obviously, of what uh, Hobi Baba explains when uh, he wrote um, The Location of Culture. So they are basically liminal beings whose dreams and lives have been deferred. Here, I want to say more about processes of fragmentation in these works, but I'm afraid I don't have time to do so. I have four minutes left. Mm -hmm. And I prefer to concentrate on my very last um, point, which is the question of mobility, uh, strategies of visibility, invisibility. So in the epigraph to um, uh, L'Invisibilité Sociale, French philosopher Guillaume Leblanc uh, uses an extract from African-American writer Ralph Ellison's uh, Invisible Man, uh, 
and the short passage uh, summarizes Ellison's main character's feeling of being invisible as a black man in US society. Uh, and I think this is something that can be uh, adapted in the context under study here. So a quote, I'm an invisible man. I am a man of substance, of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids, and I might even be said to possess a mind. I'm invisible simply because people refuse to see me. So Leblanc explains that uh, social invisibility uh, can be analyzed as a process whose ultimate consequence is the impossibility to participate in public life. And I propose to study the circulation of uh, the circulation and mobility of these uh, precarious, uh, as in uh, vie ordinaire, vie precaire by Guillaume Leblanc, these precarious Africans in Northern Britain, embodiments for some of them of spectral figures that haunt the streets of Manchester and Leeds, and that can be said to be both alive and dead. By walking, these black bodies contribute to shaping the cities of Manchester and Leeds by being visible. And I'm thinking of what French philosopher Michel de Certeau argues uh, uh, um, when it comes to walking in the city. Regarding this aspect, I would like to quote one of the last passages for today uh, from Northern Lights. It's quite long, but I think it's uh, worth taking a look at together. So David expected to be arrested, so he didn't bother to try and hide. He just kept going back to the heart of the city center and staying there where he knew that he would be very visible. It was as though it was challenging them to remove him from the city. They would beat him, they being the police. They would beat him and arrest him, but his attitude was clear. I'll just do what I want to do and I won't disappear. I won't be invisible. It was all very rational to him. He knew the consequences, but he continued to defy people. He could have had a flat or he could have been saved and invisible in different parts of the city, but didn't want to disappear. He wanted to be seen and Leeds was his battleground, his home, and he wasn't going to leave his home. He knew the safe areas, but he also knew that if he took step A, then step B would follow. He made a rational decision to take step A, which was to go back into Leeds city center and claim his right to be in the city. And I think, just to wrap things up, I think this attests to David's um, willfulness as shown in the repetition of I won't to use uh, willfulness the concept I use from uh, 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 Sarah Ahmed. Uh, um, so is, is willful and is it refuses to be a body on the edge. Uh, on the contrary, he wants to claim the part of those who have no part, to quote Jacques Rancière, by going to the very heart of the city, therefore refusing to be marginalized and wanting on the contrary to be very visible while some people refuse to see him. David won't be unseen. One, one could speak of a form of zombified mobility, to quote Annalena Twovenen, when it comes to David here. And I would also argue um, that what Phillips does is linked to narrative witnessing. Together with Guillaume Leblanc, I argue that not seeing a person is to make or let them die. And after so many years, Leeds has become David's home. At the end of Northern, Northern Lights, the narrator explained that he has been buried in a Leeds cemetery at the top of a hill. You have achieved a summit, David. Climb to the top of a hill, and from here you can look down. You are still in Leeds, forever in Leeds. On Monday, to conclude, on Monday, April 25th, 2022, so at the beginning of this week, a blue plaque uh, was unveiled on a bridge in Leeds to mark the life and death of David Oluwale, showing that this Yoruba British man deserves a place in Leeds and in Leeds history. This plaque, which, by the way, was stolen the following day, uh, 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 contributes to uh, giving David Oluwale's story of visibility or invisibility some place in the public space, therefore contributing to acknowledging the presence of Black British people in Britain. And I'm thinking here of David Olusoga's 2016 book, Black and British, a Forgotten History. And I think the presence of this plaque should be interpreted as as both a way to decolonize public space and British history by focusing on a Nigerian man whose body was marginalized, but who should be considered part and parcel of British history. Thank you.
share, etc. Um, let's ponder there, especially for me in terms of uh, the locality of this, the way these things work, and how far too often we're talking in kind of large global terms, but often we to get right back to the most local thing of the street. So that's great. So thank you for that. The, the next paper is from Alexandra Delano Alonso. She's associate professor and chair of global studies at the New School and a current holder of the Eugene M. Lang Professorship for Exit and Teaching and Mentoring. Her uh, most recent book is From Here and There, Dear Sport, Politics, Integration, and Social Rights Beyond Borders. Um, but she's doing interesting projects beyond uh, academic, academic books. She's um, uh, got a poetry collection and a short film. Um, so, obviously, more than the kind of narrow academic. Um, she's co founder and faculty fellow at the Solberg Institute on Migration and Mobility and a member of the Sanctuary Working Group at the News Group. So, I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really delighted to be here and thank you for sharing. Thank you for uh, organizing this space. Um, the work I'm presenting is work I've developed with my colleague, Benjamin Minas, over the last 12 years to consider the questions of migrant deaths and disappearances, but not just at the border, also in moments of transit and also within the countries that migrants are settled, including, for example, the, the case of undocumented migrants who died or disappeared on 9-11 and were not recognized. And from all these different spaces that we've examined, our questions focus on many of the themes that we've already discussed in the conference yesterday and this morning, why these deaths are mostly invisible or invisibilized and what happens when they are made visible, who makes them visible, how, and where are the potentialities and the tensions that emerge in doing so. Our site of analysis in the case I'm gonna to present today is the cemeteries where migrants or migrant remains are buried along the US-Mexico border which are a space in which we can see not just the fact of people dying, but also how the care or the lack of care for their remains, their burial, raises questions about grievability and the politics of mourning. Following Butler, and I know this is going to be discussed also later in the conference, what does this process of burial and care for the bodies expose, not just about the conditions experienced at the moment of death, but also about lives that are already precarious and excluded and the structures that support this. We also discuss the cemeteries as a site where we can see the limits of state responsibility and accountability at the same time that these spaces are spaces where we see the response of activists, advocates and artists to this issue, the way they engage with the deaths and make them circulate beyond the spaces uh, where migrants are buried calling for a politics of mourning against closure and invisibility with the potential of transforming these very conditions. So building on a question that was asked yesterday, you know, how can this situation change? When does mourning these deaths gain political force? We start with this poem by Paul Celan that in my interpretation speaks to this idea precisely of the erasure that occurs in spaces of burial that try to invisibilize what has happened and at the same time, pointing to the idea that the dead do not lie there, should not lie there, that as long as they circulate, there is no closure and therefore there is a space for transformation. So I'll just read this, it's an excerpt of the poem. Nowhere does anyone ask after you. The place where they lay, it has a name, it has none. They did not lie there. And let me begin with a description of one of these spaces to illustrate some of the ideas that I just talked about. Between the tall grass, the artificial flowers and the tombstones, aluminum plates lie haphazardly in the Sacred Heart Burial Park in Falfurrias, Texas. Those that are still legible read, unknown male, number 02192005, John Doe, 404353. Unknown remains, Palo Blanco, 2-15-2009. Unknown person, 0602. Unknown, unknown female, 436663. Many are bent, broken, 
and the letters or labels attached to them have fallen off or have been erased. Lawn mowers have run them over, damaging and displacing these markings intended as temporary placeholders for the location where unidentified migrant bodies and remains are buried until relatives can repatriate them or purchase a gravestone. Most of these markings have been there for years or decades, even if they were thought of as temporary markings. Until recently, few people had asked about these graves or visited them. But when the number of migrants dying near Falfurrias, Texas, rose to become one of the highest along the US-Mexico border, the media, forensic anthropologists, human rights organizations, consulates, and pro-immigrant activist groups and individuals were drawn to this very small town that is not exactly at the border, but 82 miles north of the Texas-Mexico border. People found markings that did not correspond to the locations where the bodies were supposed to be, multiple bodies buried in the same grave or commingled in body bags, trash bags, shopping bags, or milk crates. And there was an absence of any forensic reports or DNA samples that would allow hundreds of unidentified border crossers to be named. At his office in Falfurrias, the county seat, Deputy Sheriff Benny Martinez argues that this is a result of lack of resources, space, and support from the federal government that leaves local governments few options in dealing with the dead in Brooks County. During the past years, migrants have been funneled, in quotes, to Texas as a result of the stricter enforcement of border controls in other areas of the border to the West in California and Arizona. Um, and in this situation, the sheriff's office and one of the local funeral homes, Funeraria del Angel, have been forced from one day to the next to become experts in recovering an overwhelming number of bodies from the desert and ranch lands in the area. In the case of Elizondo Mortuary in the city of Mission, where some of the bodies are sent, the funeral home family business has also become the point of contact for relatives looking for the disappeared migrants. And with their own means, the family that owns this mortuary have created a data bank of personal effects that can help identify the bodies. In contrast to other counties facing this issue, Brooks County does not receive any additional funds from the federal government because those funds are allocated only to counties that are exactly on the border. Um, but the strategies of these, these funneling strategies have directed migrants to other areas that are not supported in any way. This so-called funnel effect is a result of border enforcement policies that have led migrants to seek new rights, new routes to get to the United States, avoiding areas that since the mid 1990s have become more actively patrolled with border fences, technology, border patrol and military. In recent years, border control strategies in Mexico and the violence of drug cartels have also contributed to new routes um, that create more risks for migrants. An estimated 200 to 500 people die every year at the US-Mexico border since 1993 as a result of this strategy that's called prevention through deterrence, uh, whose goal was to increase border enforcement near urban areas and direct migrants to more remote areas of the border where the desert, the mountains, and dangerous river crossings would become the natural borders and deterrence for them to cross, knowing that the risk of dying would be much higher there. Obviously, this has not occurred. And instead, we have seen this rise of both undocumented migration and border deaths. However, as Jason De Leon has shown, these deaths are not unexpected or an unintended outcome of these policies. In fact, um, it, it, it is documented that these deaths are part of the strategy of border control itself. In the eyes of the state, these deaths become evidence that their policies are working and the government can lay their responsibility on the natural elements of the terrain and on migrants themselves for, for taking these risks, knowing what, is, what it entails. Despite the fact that government has documented and explicitly recognized that they knew and had planned for the fact that these, poli these policies could lead to more deaths, any responsibility for them is deflected to the mountains, to the desert, to the terrain, to the temperatures, to the wildlife even. Na these natural elements also erase evidence and provide plausible deniability regarding blame for what happens in these remote areas as a result of these policies. With the increase in public awareness about the consequences of policies that have lasted and have been expanded over two decades, migrant deaths 
have increasingly been approached through a frame of humanitarian crisis. This framing has led to a focus on immediate responses and support systems, including governments on both sides of the border, NGOs, volunteer groups, and in some counties like Arizona, a huge development of forensic work to identify these remains. But any of these responses are dependent on political will and resources available, not through government, but through other resources. Um, these resources mostly are directed toward the recovery of bodies and the identification of remains, but without any real consequences in terms of assigning responsibility for these deaths or shifting these policies in another direction. Uh, as Joseph Nevins argues, border deaths are widely accepted as a fact of life across the United States. So how can responsibility and accountability be assigned in a way that can be transformed, that can transform these conditions? I'm gonna show you more photos of um, other cemeteries along the US-Mexico border. Um, in addition to the Sacred Heart Cemetery in Falfurias, here we see the Holtville Cemetery in California, and then I'll show you the Evergreen Cemetery in Tucson, Arizona. And this, so you can see in a very material way what these spaces look like and the state that these graves are in. With lack of funding, many of the markers that have been placed many years ago are erased, sunken in, laid in disorder at the edge of cemeteries, run over by lawnmowers. One of the key elements that we want to point out in our work as part of this focus on responsibility and accountability is how these sites of burial of unknown migrants in the margins of cemeteries with precarious markers are a way of reproducing the invisibility and the, marginalized, the marginalization of people on both sides across the border, including those who attempt to cross and those seeking closure when they cannot find them, cannot identify their remains, cannot find ways to search for them. This inequality reveals as much about the disregard for migrants as recognized members of a political community or their precarious political position as it does about the denial of state and social responsibility of these violations of rights, both in life and in death. Activists and migrant rights organizations try to fill the voids of care and responsibility by politicizing intentionally or unintentionally the bodies and remains of the dead migrants and challenging these boundaries of grievability. We've seen many examples of this throughout the conference, but I, I want to point out a few more here. Um, this is a cemetery in, in Arizona, and you can see they all vary. There's no real policy of how to um, how to identify these markers. Some people are cremated without um, permission from family members since they cannot be contacted. Um, so the, the second part of my presentation is, is how do activists engage in these spaces? Uh, and this is a quote from Kat Rodriguez who is part of the Coalición de Derechos Humanos in Arizona and echoing the poem read earlier, she talks in this quote about um, how, how to move these, these processes of mourning and activism beyond the cemetery, that that is not the location, that it's necessary to take these deaths and circulate them beyond these spaces mm -hmm. in order to make them um, move a political, have a political consequence and not silence them. So this is the, this is the offices of the Coalición de Derechos Humanos where they store the instead of uh, leaving these markers at the cemeteries and engaging with them there, they um, put the names of, of everyone that has been um, identified as missing on these crosses and um, name them by year. And their work entails um, circulating them in a yearly procession that takes place during the Day of the Dead, where they trace a route similar to the routes uh, that migrants um, follow uh, in order to make them visible to, to the communities in the area. We also see the work of, of other activists that take photos of the remains that have been found into protests and other areas, or um, artists that have engaged with the border wall to also show the, the impact it has on, on deaths. And this is an action that organized by Frontera de Cristo, another organization in uh, Arizona, that takes the crosses out to the street every week um, and this is a way of making them circulate um, permanently and more widely in their communities. 
Interventions such as these can be understood as a disturbance of a consensus, a politics of dissensus in Rancière's sense, which has been quoted a lot uh, in the last two days. Um, and here, following Rancière, consensus is not to be understood here as the outcome of a specific debate or explicit agreement, but as a partition of the sensible, meaning the assignment of specific roles by a police order that designates only certain acts as visible and only certain speech as audible and that ultimately relies on the absence of voids or supplements. Accordingly, political action or this staging of dissensus in actions such as these always has an aesthetic component in that it undermines existing configurations of the sensible and brings into perception what the partition has so far kept out for fear of disruption. Our work has asked what it means to make deaths visible in these ways both the cemeteries and what the burial practices reveal, but also the circulation of them outside of these spaces. As a starting point, we ask what it means for these remains to be physically in the US, <laughs> unknown in these, remote, in these remote spaces. What do they tell us about not just the politics of migration, but the structural violence of these policies <laughs> and of control and enforcement that exacerbate existing inequalities that put some people at more risk than others, of dying, of not being recognized at the moment of death, but also in their lives. Over the years, there have been many actions to call attention to these deaths at the US-Mexico border through activism, through art, and yet little has changed in terms of the conditions that migrants face. Uh, in fact, one could argue that these conditions have become even more dangerous on both sides of the border. So how can making these deaths visible through interventions such as these evoke questions of responsibility and accountability, not just at the government level, but also in society. In what ways can, in, can these interventions that call to make visible what has been made invisible call us to action and create a different context that challenges injustice? And this is where I connect to the beginning of our presentation, arguing that this is not just an issue at the border, that, it, that what is happening is a result of structural conditions of exclusion and injustice present in the everyday, in the way that migration structures have been built and how they intersect with economic and political structures that discriminate against, against marginalized populations and particularly people of color. We see in other moments like 9-11, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy or COVID, how some communities are more vulnerable than others and how attempts to recognize them in a moment of crisis or in a moment of death reveal a precarious status of policies that exclude them, make them vulnerable, and that their vulnerability and visibility is part of what makes those same systems, political and economic, work. So the call is not just to address a recognition of their deaths, to name them, to bury them as they deserve, but to address the reasons that make them vulnerable in the first place, why their deaths become part of a structure of policies and laws that continue to generate these conditions without any cost to those who design, implement them, and benefit from them. Against these narratives and these policies, activists at the border call to make these deaths part of a call to action, to make them circulate and be present as reminders of what needs to change. So one of the, of the ways that this, um, this call has been taking place is, for example, in how the, the activists that have been fighting for migrant deaths uh, to, to, to challenge these regimes have also been joining other struggles. For example, the caravans of mothers of disappeared migrants and other disappeared in Mexico, calling to address the root causes of migration, but also to change the current economic and political systems that have been causing deaths across the region, not just for migrants, but for other um, individuals in precarious position um, or joining struggles in the US like the movement for black lives and showing the connection between over-policing criminalization um, and, the, and the regimes uh, of, of uh, migration control. So to end, going back to the starting point, when does grief gain political force? As we've discussed in this last few days, making deaths visible can have the negative effect of proving precisely what the state wants to prove through these policies, making part, being, becoming part of the spectacle, creating deterrence and a narrative where the migrant is to blame. Or also on the other hand, how a politics of mourning, of collective mourning, of, of memorializing can also be seen as an act of closure without addressing the underlying structures that cause these deaths. 
So when and how can a politics of mourning these deaths become a transformative power that addresses the violence at the border, but also the structural violence that underlies it? I think what's powerful about the notion of mourning is that mourning implies a transformation. And this transformation is also an open space where new potentialities emerge. The question here is how to mourn these deaths collectively as an open call for these deaths to move in the sense of moving to action, to transformation of everyday spaces where we can see the connections between vulnerability and the at the border and other spaces of shared vulnerability in these larger structures. Um, Elise was bringing up yesterday the, the question of the implicated subject. So exactly. I think, hmm? exactly. Elsa, uh, so I think that Elise was your character. <laughs> um, so I think this is important in terms of thinking about the possibilities for action, not just at the border, but in our implication in broader systems that are part of this border policy. So I'll leave it here. Thank you. Two, two relationship papers which had more synergies than we might have thought at the start. Um, this disturbance of consensus, I think, is so important. And one way in which I've tracked it is through what I call guerrilla memorialization. It might be kind of a way to talk about these things, but I think it's really important what you say about the fact that they shouldn't be an end in themselves. That means they need to lead to change. Yeah, great papers. Have we got um, questions for these? Uh, <laughs> okay, please call Alexandra. Thank you very much for this fascinating presentation. I was wondering if you could tell us more or reflect on the blame that has been given uh, to these people on those two graves. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? Or, uh, what does it tell us about these policies? Mm -hmm. John Doe is not very. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's that's very interesting. I think first that not all of them are are named John Doe or Jane Doe. Right, and, and you can see here in what I was reading at the beginning, uh, a great variation in the choice to name as unknown, um, as unidentified or um, unknown male, or here you have the John Doe's, Jane Doe's, um, and here John Doe, but also unknown. Um, so in a way, um, it's it's an interesting fact of you know how they're, their burial and their arrival in, in the US territory, you know, they, they acquire these, these, these names. Um, but I, I also think what's interesting here is, uh, is that there is, no, there is no consensus here of how to deal with these deaths. And it shows this sort of, on the one hand, lack of care that because it's very difficult to, to trace people who have been able to identify through DNA that there is a match have then been unable to find the actual place where the, where the body is buried or where the remains are because of the haphazard way in which this is laid out and the, and the lack of systematic naming and, and placing these markers. So, so it's, a, it, it's really, you know, it, it, it's a disregard in, in, in every way for, for, for the remains. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, and I didn't mention how this, this engagement by one of the community organizations in the area um, to put crosses on top of and, and rocks on top of these markers to say more than, you know, they're, they're more than just the John Doe, they're not forgotten. That's what it says, no olvidado means not forgotten. Um, but over time they've been, access has been restricted to this cemetery for activists, one because the government, local government didn't want to draw attention to, the, to this potter's field, but also because the fact that they were buried without following the, the procedures uh, means that the, 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 the land is caving in. And so it's very dangerous to walk there. If you walk there, um, the land caves in. And so it's become a, a dangerous space and you can see the, the markers themselves caving in and, and being broken. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? One from Francis. Um, question, one from Francis. Uh, you, you mentioned this plate, which was uh, disappeared the day after it 